it's Jacqueline or Galactica and welcome back to my channel. I thought I'd show my face for once in this video. I have done it a few times before but I figured you know that's what all the cool YouTubers are doing so why not. Anyway for today's video considering a lot of you are here from my Facebook giveaway which at the time of filming hasn't been announced yet but at the time of release it would have been so congratulations to those of you who won that giveaway. I hope that you like my work, but considering a lot of you are here for my pet portraits, especially recently from that giveaway, I figured I would do a little tutorial for you on my process of how I draw my pet portraits. So let's get into that. Today I'm going to show you how to easily sketch a dog using the grid method. I will be doing a follow up video and teaching you guys how to paint in watercolour so if you're watching from the future I'll leave a link in the iCard section above but if not make sure to subscribe to my channel so that you're here next week and you get a notification for when I upload that video. Let's go through what you'll need. I started with some Archer's watercolour paper because I'll be painting this in watercolour later but you can use any surface that you like. I'm using a clear ruler, a kneadable eraser, which I had way too much fun kneading here, a retractable eraser, which I absolutely love, but you can use any eraser that you have on hand, a H grade pencil, which is my ultimate favorite. You can see how worn it is at the top there. And I also threw in a mechanical pencil, which is optional because I don't actually use it in this video. It just depends on what you prefer. You'll also need an iPad, a tablet, or a phone, whichever you prefer. I never used to have an iPad and used to do all my pet portraits on my phone. And this is the app that I used using Grid Hash. These are the settings that I have set. I like to use a three by three grid and make sure that it's square. I open up my photo and I have the upgrade for this app so I'm able to move my grid. It's not that expensive, but I will show you an alternative later. Then I take a screenshot of the photo because I find that this app, if you go out of it and then come back into it, the grid will reset in the original position. So I like to screenshot it, crop it, and then once I go to photos, it will be in full screen. If you like, you can then grab your ruler and measure the grid exactly how it is on the iPad. But I just tend to use a four by four centimeter grid on my A5 paper. An alternative to that one is Arty, which is a newer app and I really like it because you can select certain colors in your reference photo and it will tell you which color matches it. But the grid on this one, it's not movable, but what I suggest you do is crop your photo to the exact size that you want and then once you put it through either app, you'll be able to just overlay the grid on the exact size photo that you need. It might take a little bit of tweaking, but that's how I used to do it before I upgraded the grid hash app. The next step that we're going to move on to is drawing our grid onto our watercolour paper or whichever paper you've chosen to draw on today. I do a 4x4 grid as I mentioned just before and I find that that works really well on an A5 size paper but if you're sizing up your paper you need to size up your grid as well or you need to use more squares in your grid. So it's going to be a matter of finding out which type of grid style that you like and which suits your art style more. So I prefer a really simple grid and using it as just a guideline. I'm more focused on grabbing the essence of what I'm drawing rather than trying to do a super realistic piece. You might have noticed that I only marked the bottom and the right hand side of my grid. If you feel more comfortable marking both sides so you have a straighter line then go ahead and do that. But I use the clear ruler for this reason so I can judge it by the markings of the um, measurements. Now we're on to drawing our piece out. So I almost always start with the nose. I like to kind of get that and then the base shape of the muzzle and then move on to the head to get the proportions right before I go adding on details like the eyes. In this case, the dog is facing forward, so I don't have to worry about a mouth at all. But if you do, I tend to add that at the same time that I'm adding a nose. If you'd like to use this reference photo, I will leave a link in the description box below and make sure that you comment on that with your creations if you do decide to do this along with me. This reference photo is of Bailey. She's a miniature dash hound and she belongs to a very good friend of mine and I know that she would love to see everyone's creations. 
So what you see me doing here is going up the side of the muzzle and the face and establishing that really light outline. I'm not going too hard on my pencil because I am going to color it later and I don't want any harsh lines to show through or any markings on the page. That's why I opt to use a H grade pencil rather than an HB or a 2B. I find that this is the lightest grade without being really scratchy. Although I have bought H pencils after this one and they just seem different. Like this one is a whole lot better. That's why I've used it so much and it's so worn at the front because I don't want to use a different one. They're not the same. <laughs> I don't know why. The really helpful thing about grids is being able to figure out where in relation to each of the grid lines certain aspects of the drawing are. So for the edge of the face, I know that it's kind of just over halfway from the outside grid line. So I can pretty much place exactly where that side of the face needs to be. Again, I'm very, very loosely sketching this out. That's just how I like to work because I know that I'll go through it again with watercolor. So I just kind of, I, I look at certain points of the drawing, like how I'm doing with the ear right here. I can tell that that's kind of in the middle of that particular square. And I do the same thing with other aspects of the reference photo. I do want to reiterate here that I do not do realism. I take the essence of whatever I'm drawing and put it down really loosely, really fluidly. That's just how I prefer to work. But if you're looking for more realism, then I do suggest using a, a grid with more squares in it. So maybe like a six by six or something like that. So you have more guidelines to work, work off of. This could also be beneficial if you're not totally confident on your proportions or your dog breeds. I do find that knowing certain breeds does help me with my artwork. I have met this dog. I know what this dog looks like in real life. And I think that that also helps as well. But just getting used to using the grid is super helpful in proportions anyway. But if you need a little bit extra than a three by three, then go ahead and do that. Find what works for you because this is just my method of doing it. And yeah, everyone else has their own method. You could also use the measurements of your reference as well. So if you have an iPad and you're using it from an iPad and you've used the exact measurements like how I mentioned at the start, you can actually measure where certain points of your reference photo match up to that grid. So then you can transfer it onto the grid a lot easier with the exact measurements of where the ear would end or where the nose would end or how long the nose needs to be, how far apart the eyes need to be. So if you did want to start off like that and use the exact same measurements as your digital grid on your paper grid, then go ahead and do that. Moving on to the eyes, I mark out in my brain the main points of where the eye would be in relation to the grid. So I really do like it when the eyes match up with a point in the grid because it makes it a whole lot easier to place those eyes. In this case, I was really lucky and it matched up in a corner. So I could figure out how much of the eye needed to be above the middle line, how much needed to be below it, and how much needed to be on the right hand side of it as well. I know that sounds really complicated, but if you try it yourself, then you will understand what I mean. Usually when I'm sketching these out, I don't put a pupil or any of that shading in the eye, but for the purpose of this video to make it look less creepy, I decided to add the shading and the pupil. This would be beneficial if you're a beginner to figure out how the eyelid would make a shadow over the eye as well for when you're coloring it later. So for the second eye, I like to draw a line between where the two corners of each eye would be just to make sure that they're on the same level and not wonky at all. Very rarely will the grid match up to the corners of the eye. So I like to do this as a, just a little bit of extra guideline for that. I'm also starting to block in the shadow of the brow above those eyes as well. So that brings us on to step four, the shadows and the details. I added very little shadows and details into the initial sketch except for maybe in those brows but now I'm going in now that I can tell my proportions are correct and adding little details that's going to help me with the coloring later. I don't usually put as much detail in as I'm about to in the video but it's just to give you an idea of trying to figure out where the light and dark is in your references. So using that reference photo and that grid while you still have it to block in those dark sections. 
So here I'm just putting in the shadow of the nose and where the darkest part of the nose would be. You'll always have that highlight on the top part and the shadow on the bottom part. And now I'm figuring out using my grid while I still have it, where those shadows would be. This dog only has one colored fur, but there are so many variations of that color that it is important to, to recognize where those shadows would be. I find that this method is super helpful when you have a dog or a cat that has markings. So tabby cats or brindle dogs, anything with stripes or any kind of markings, this is really helpful to block out those different colors and those different sections of the fur. Interestingly enough, when I was a beginner and sometimes even still now, I find that single colored dogs and cats are harder than multicolored dogs and cats. Purely because you have to think of different ways to portray that color variation when you're painting it or coloring it or whatever you're doing with, you know, basically the same color. Whereas when you have markings, you can create different points of interest using different colors. For the purpose of this video, though, I thought it was important to show you guys the light and dark and shadows and that kind of stuff on a single colored dog so it doesn't get too confusing and there's not too much going on and I can show you very simply where those shadows would be and it's also a really great reference photo. Not often will you be able to have a great reference photo. Not everyone is a photographer, not everyone's dog is a good poser. You know, a lot of the times you will have a photo of a dog that is no longer with us and you can't get another reference photo. But this one is really good because it's front on. You can see both of the eyes. The light source is great. And so that's why I figured I would link it down below for you guys to check out and maybe give it a go because yeah, not often will you get a good reference photo unless you're using stock images off of Google or any kind of shutter stock, that kind of thing. At this point, I'm erasing my grid lines. I didn't want to get too far into the shading before I did this because I would end up erasing some of my shading anyway. So I just put in the main details and then I will go in a little bit more later. I'm using a makeup brush to rub, like to brush away my eraser shavings. And I find that that's a really good method instead of using your hand because your hand is oily. It can get stuck to the paper. You know, it's, it's just a whole lot easier if you use a brush. Now that the grid lines are gone, I can block in larger sections of shadow to get that depth and to reiterate that in my mind to know where the shadows are when I go in for coloring later. In terms of the body, I very rarely put much detail in the body. I just kind of do a little bit of the chest. In this case, there was a collar in the photo, so I just kind of improvised and changed it up a bit so it's not as much of a feature. This part is completely optional, but I always add a name at the bottom just to add, you know, that little extra something to the piece and to really personalize it. I'm really satisfied with where the portrait is at at the moment. So I go in with my kneadable eraser, which I really love kneading, and I pick up a lot of that excess graphite that's on the paper. You don't want to go too far in this one because you still need that those guidelines, but it just helps kind of take away some of that excess um, color so when you go over it in watercolor or whatever you're going to use later then it will be a lot easier to cover up. At the end I'll always compare my drawing to the reference photo and make sure that there's nothing that needs changing. Generally if you're using this method then there will be very little that you need to tweak but there will always be some kind of little things that you need to adapt. You just got to keep going until you're satisfied with the drawing. Remember at this point not to stress too much about it because you will be going over it later and make sure that you come back next week so you can see how I do the watercolor and the details with that. But alternatively, you can keep going with your pencil and this is where the mechanical pencil would come in handy and you can do something like this. Just add in all those details that you need to add and it can create a really amazing drawing. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to see you back next week for part two when we learn how to paint this in watercolor. See you then.